All right, uh, hello everyone, and welcome to today's CryUEM Current Practices webinar. You're joining the three national centers established by the NIH Common Fund Transformative High Resolution Cryoelectron Microscopy Program. My name is Christina Zamani. I'm a scientist and training liaison at the National Center for CryUEM Access and Training, NCCAT. I'm uh, joined here today by my colleague here at NCCAT, Ed Eng, as well as Lauren Hales Beck from the Pacific Northwest CryoEM Center, PNCC, and Michael Schmidt from the Stanford Slack CryoEM Center, S2C2. Uh, NCCAT has invited today's speakers, James Chen and Brandon Malone, and I'll give them a proper introduction um, after my colleagues from each of the centers give a quick overview and update on the cryoEM resources we offer at no cost to the research community. Uh, for those of you new to our series, CryoEM Current Practices is an ongoing event that we host the last Thursday of every month at this same time, uh, highlighting particularly the methods that researchers are using to obtain and interpret the data they can collect at the national centers. Uh, so we already have our speaker lined up for next month. Um, PNCC is hosting Zhang Ren, a postdoc at the Van Andel, Van Andel Institute, who will be presenting on lessons learned from sample preparation and structural analysis of three membrane channels. So uh, do save the date for our future talks. Uh, we are recording today's talk, and you'll find the recording along with those from past talks on our events page at uh, cryoemcenters.org, uh, along with registration links for future talks. And you'll also find general information about the larger NIH Common Fund Cryoem program on that website. A couple of final logistics. Uh, please use the Q&A feature to send questions at any point during the talk or upvote other questions you see there. And uh, if you have questions directed to logistics or access at the centers, our panelists here will respond to them directly in the Q&A box and we'll save uh, the questions for our speakers for the end of our talk. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to a quick update from our uh, center representatives and i'm going to let lauren take it away first awesome. thanks christina so my name is lauren hillsbeck and i'm the project coordinator for pncc or pacific northwest cryo em center so we offer one proposal type for single particle analysis and also tomography um, and these this proposal type gives up to 480 hours a year for up to two years um, we do have a monthly submission deadline on the first of every month and each approved proposal will be delegated what we call a SPOC, a scientific point of contact for you to ask your scientific questions. We have five microscopes. We have one Arctica with K3, a, a Krios with Falcon 3 K3, two Krioses with Falcon 3 BioQuantum K3, and one Krios with Falcon 3 BioContinuum K3 that we'll be upgrading to Falcon 4. Uh, for sample preparation, we have a VitroBot, uh, like a GP2 and a VitroJet, which is currently undergoing validation still um, before being offered to users. Um, we're also under restrictions at this point, and we're offering remote one-on-one -on -one training and small remote workshops. And then once we can have on-site visitors, again, we plan to offer small on-site workshops covering microscope operation and sample preparation. So apply today. Thank you, Lauren. And uh, now, Michael. Good morning, afternoon. Uh, I'm Mike Schmidt, and I'm uh, one of the co-PIs at the Stanford Slack Cryoem Center. And uh, like the other centers, we have uh, Krioses. We have three Krioses with both K3 and Falcon 4 cameras and with and without um, energy filters. Uh, we also have time available on a, um, on a Talos Arctica for, for training and exploratory access. All of our, um, all of our applications are considered uh, one at a time and customized and modularized, both in our training and in our service uh, to, to train and to serve uh, all aspects uh, that people would like to have for uh, data collection, specimen preparation, uh, exploratory access, and high resolution data collection. Uh, please visit us at the cryoem center slack.stanford.edu uh, s2c2 and apply for time and or training thank you thank you mike 
And Ed, I will turn it over to you. Hi, my name is Ed. I'm the manager at NCCAT. We have two main access types, uh, an instrument access proposal on one of our four dedicated Creos instruments, as well as a cross-training proposal, which allows embedding here at NCCAT. We allow users on site with health precautions. This week, we had our first uh, instrument access user uh, actually on site for their session. And next month, we plan on a lot of our embedded trainees to come on site. We also will have a graphene making workshop in August. So if you didn't get in, we'll put all the online content also coming up with my colleague, Craig Yoshioka at NCC, we have an ACA workshop on facility managing for Crowium and our colleague, Mark Herzig, will have the fundamentals. So there's still time to sign up for the ACA workshop and we'll see you next month. Thank you, Ed. All right, so now on to our main event. Uh, our speakers today are James Chen and Brandon Malone, uh, who are presenting work they did together while they were lab mates, uh, co-advised by professor, Professor Seth Darst and Elizabeth Campbell at the Rockefeller University. Uh, the Darst and Campbell labs study mechanisms of transcription initiation and inhibition of RNA polymerase using cryo-EM along with other methods. And as uh, RNA polymerase experts, they were among the many groups who pivoted uh, to make very quick contributions to our understanding of SARS-CoV-2 biology by applying methods they were familiar with uh, to this new target. Uh, James received his bachelor's degree at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, completed his PhD at Rockefeller in March of 2020, uh, concurrent with doing uh, the work you'll hear about today. And uh, he's now doing postdoctoral research in the labs of Girababa and Damien Eckert at NYU. And uh, we're grateful he was willing to join us today and uh, revisit the end of his PhD work. Uh, Brandon received his bachelor's degree at University College Cork in Ireland and is now a fourth year graduate student continuing his structural studies of RNA polymerase. And uh, along with uh, working together in the lab to do the beautiful work you'll see today, uh, Brandon and James enjoy taking their collaboration beyond the lab and enjoy hikes outside the city uh, together like you saw in that, in that picture on the intro slide. Uh, so thank you to uh, both of you for joining us today and we look forward um, to hearing about how you cover all the bases and structural perspectives of SARS-CoV-2 RNA synthesis. And the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, Christina. Um, and Brett and I would like to give a big thanks to the organizers of this wonderful webinar series, and as well as everyone who uh, took the time to uh, attend our talk uh, about the structural perspectives of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, replication transcription complex. Sorry. All right, um, so SARS uh, coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2 uh, is a positive strand RNA uh, virus uh, that belongs to uh, the neoviral uh, order. Uh, the SARS-CoV-2 genome is about 30 kilobases in size and encode multiple open reading frames um, or ORFs, uh, basically to encode non-structural proteins and structural proteins that are important for the viral life cycle. So ORF1A and ORF1B encode the non-structural proteins NSB1 through NSB16. Uh, and these proteins are important for infection cells. Notably, the NSB12 gene uh, encodes the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, or RDRP, and this enzyme uh, binds to NSB7 and 8 uh, to form the holo enzyme, the, or also known as holo RDRP. The holo RDRP um, it's responsible for the synthesis of all viral RNA molecules and is the target for antivirals such as remdesivir. And the hollow RDRP is thought to coordinate with other accessory factors to achieve function replication transcription. Uh, some of these factors include the NSP13 helicase, which is the SF1B uh, RNA helicase. Uh, 
SB1014, which is an excellent nuclease complex that's involved in viral proofreading, and SB15, which is an endoribonuclease, and lastly, SB1016, which is an RNA capping complex. So how these uh, different accessory factors function in conjunction with the replication transcription complex is not well understood. Um, so we basically want to see how these um, factors function together in order to successfully replicate the coronavirus genome and transcribe the subgenomic RNAs that are vital for the viral life cycle. Um, so why would coronaviruses possess such accessory factors to facilitate replication and transcription? So the RNA synthesis pathway in coronavirus is quite complex and is can be broken can be broken down into two modes: uh, a continuous mode and discontinuous mode. Uh, so continuous RNA synthesis would is utilized to replicate the um, positive strand RNA genome of the virus, whereas discontinuous um, transcription is used to generate uh, subgenomic transcripts that can be translated by the host cell machinery. And this process involves these transcription regulatory sequences that, um, or TRSs, that basically create transcription stalls on the RNA template. And this subsequently leads to template switching that ultimately lead to the generation of these sgRNAs. And another reason for having so many accessory factors to facilitate replication is that they, it's important to maintain the 30 kilobase single strand RNA genome. And notably, coronaviruses encode a three prime to five prime exonuclease uh, in the form of NSB1014 in order to um, have proofreading activity. Um, so when we first started this work, uh, there was some previous literature that suggests that there was an interaction between the NSB13 helicase and the RDRP. So we chose to first look at, uh, first chose to look at uh, this coupling structurally. Uh, so we first started our studies off by purifying NSB7, 8, 12, and 13 from E. coli then using an RNA scaffold composed of a template RNA sequence uh, annealed to a product RNA. Uh, we assemble the complex and visualize by gel shift assays. Uh, shown here is an example of such an assay. Uh, so basically, in the presence of NSB78, the RDRP NSB12, it's able to form a stable complex with the annealed RNA. And this is shown with this upshift in uh, gel mobility. Uh, so this uh, band corresponds to the replication transcription complex, or RTC. And then when we add NSP13 to the mix, uh, we see that this RTC band is further shifted upward, um, indicating the formation of a complex with NSP13. And we further wanted to confirm this hit by native mass spectrometry. Uh, and we basically flew uh, NSB12 alone, and then we added NSB7 and 8 with the RNA scaffold, and we saw that there was a shift in the spectra uh, with a mass that corresponds to the replication transcription complex. And then we added NSB13 to the RTC, and we saw a peak that corresponded to an RTC bound to NSB13. And this evidence, these are evidence that we have a stable complex. So we wanted to look at uh, this complex by a single particle cry EM in order to solve its structure. So I'll briefly go through our pipeline um, that we use to uh, solve the structure of this complex. Uh, so we first took movies of this sample and frame corrected using motion core two. Then in CrossFart, we did a bunch of pre-processing steps and then curated uh, our data set using 2D classification. And with this curated set of particles, we were able to generate um, 3D templates through using CrowdSpire ab initio reconstruction. Then these 3D templates were used as uh, templates to uh, run 
crossbar heterogeneous refinement and multiple iterations were used to further curate our particles. We then went back to ab initial reconstruction with the curated subsets of particles in order to generate uh, 3D templates that uh, gave the best uh, alignment. And then lastly, uh, we ran the particles using the non-uniform refinement in CrossBart. And ultimately in one in this one data set, we were able to find four distinct uh, classes, all which have different um, protein compositions and RNA compositions. Um, I'd like to focus our attention on this RTC that's bound to two NSP13s. And when we first looked at the cryo EM density map, we were able to fit in the protein components in the RNA uh, pretty well. Uh, however, when we went to build in domains and um, model side chains, this was quite difficult. And if you notice that the, the EM density looks quite uh, perturbed or stretchy, uh, we think this is due to um, particle orientation bias. And when we calculate uh, the 3D FSC score uh, and looked at the heat map with the Euler, angle, um, uh, Euler angles in the data set, we see that uh, this data set has, uh, is pretty impacted by particle orientation bias. Um, so we use a number of approaches to overcome this bias, um, particularly at the data processing level. We wanted to call the overrepresented uh, particle views, uh, and we did this at the 2D level. So shown here is a 2D classification of the previous data sets. Um, so we basically see an abundance of this butterfly-like projection. And prior to 3D refinement, we would remove these guys. Um, basically, they're highlighted in red uh, in order to effectively remove the particle orientation bias. But in our hands, um, after we did the refinement, the maps didn't improve that much. And uh, a kind of caveat to this approach is that you lose a lot of particles and subsequently resolution. And another approach that we used to call the data set was to run multiple uh, iterations of ab initio reconstruction. This will allow us to remove particles in an unbiased fashion. And we basically let CryoSpot determine the particle views that would lead to a more isotropic 3D map. Uh, so shown here is the example in our case. So we had a class of curated particles, and then we ran three rounds of ab initio reconstruction in CryoSpark um, using two seats uh, per round. And we basically selected the map that looked, corresponded to the complex and then ran it through three rounds. And what we got out of this processing is an improved map where kind of the streakiness is less pronounced. However, it was still very hard to kind of model um, into the density very confidently. Uh, so we also looked at other approaches to kind of ameliorate this bias. Uh, so we looked at different grids. Uh, we ultimately settled on using C-flat grids since that gave us the best ice thickness and particle distribution. And we also collected tilted data. Um, and in, in this case, we saw that we got more views of this particular particle. However, when we did the final 3D reconstruction, we could see that the densities for the HeLa case are still very uh, unresolved. So lastly, we, we turned to uh, detergents. Um, we basically looked at the sample in the presence of beta octoglucoside and CHAPSO, since our previous experience with DNA-dependent RNA polymerase samples show that these, uh, these detergents help ameliorate the particle orientation bias. So we ultimately went with CHAPSO for our sample prep, and we did our single particle uh, cryo analysis in the presence of CHAPSO. And we collected movies of the complex and frame aligned in Motion Core 2. And we did part uh, pre-processing steps in CryoSpark and ended up with a curated set of particles after 2D classification. And we then um, uh, generated 3D templates using ab initio reconstruction. And then we ran multiple rounds of heterogeneous refinement and then uh, rerunning ab initio uh, reconstructions to generate templates that align really well with our uh, particle data set. 
And lastly, we curated the particles and then ran a particle polishing program in Reliant. And then using these polished particles, we ran a final refinement using the non-uniform refinement in CryoSpark. And from this data set, we saw three distinct classes, each with kind of unique compositions of uh, protein subunits. Um, so we saw an RTC bound to one NSP13, an RTC bound to two NSP13s, and a dimer of this class. And focusing on the predominant class, we looked at the cryogen density of the RTC bound to two NSP13s. And we now see that the cryogen's density is much more well resolved. Um, and we can model confidently the different domains of the helix case and also sidechain residues. And when we looked at the 3D FSC score and the, uh, the Euler angle uh, heat map, we see that uh, Chapso effectively um, ameliorates the particle orientation bias. So with this cryon map at hand, we were able to generate a 3D model. And this is shown in the movie on the right. So shown here is the overall architecture of the uh, two NSPs bound to an RTC complex. And what we see is that there are two helicases bound to the RTC, NSP 13.1 and 13.2. And then the next few slides will show a side view that highlight the protein comp uh, components of the hollow RDRP, uh, which are NSP 7 and 8 uh, in register with the RNA scaffold. Uh, so as shown here is the duplex region, which will correspond to the upstream uh, region of the replication uh, complex. And then shown here is the single strand RNA, which corresponds to the downstream uh, uh, template RNA. And we see that this RNA is threaded through the NSP13 helicase. And it's interesting that um, this configuration is quite interesting since the NSP13 helicase is parked right in front of the RDRP active site in such a way that its translocation will oppose the translocation of the RDRP. And we'll go into more detail about this uh, conundrum in later slides. Uh, and other structural features that I would like to highlight that we see in our cryo map is this cavity in NSP12, which will correspond to an NTP entry channel. And then look at the back view of the complex, we see that the single strand downstream template RNA is threaded through the NSP13.1 active site. And then a rotation in the front shows that these, this protein RNA interaction is facilitated by the 1B domain and the REC-A domains of the helicase. And then the position of the helicase is further mediated by the presence of NSB8 and the facilitated by the interactions between the NSB8 and the ZBDs of the helicase. And during our cryo analysis, we uh, noticed that there was quite a bit of heterogeneity in this region of the complex, uh, which would correspond to the helicase, um, the NSB13.2 and 13.1 helicase domains of REC-A and 1B. Um, so we chose to look at this region by focused classification and particle uh, subtraction. Uh, so we first augmented our particle data set so that we had a larger uh, particle counts uh, at higher resolution at 2.9 angstrom resolution. Uh, shown here is the consensus map uh, after, the, uh, after augmenting our data. Um, shown here are the NSB 13.1 and NSB 13.2 uh, helicase and the maps that we defined around the RECA domains is shown in gray mesh. And using focus classification with single subtraction, we were able to deconvolute four distinct classes. Uh, the first class being an APO class in which the NSP 13.1 active, uh, active state, uh, site is completely empty of 
and there's no RNA bound. Um, the second class is this engaged class, uh, where we see that the downstream template RNA uh, is threaded due to the NSB 13.1 and the 1B and RecA domains uh, uh, class around the RNA. Uh, the third class we observed was this swiveled state in which the NSB 13.1 is rotated with respect to the RTC. And the fourth class we saw is this open class in which the 1B domain of the NSP 13.1 is rotated downward towards the uh, stock and ZBDs. And show on the right is the is a movie that kind of showcases each class. And so starting with the engaged class, here's a zoom in of the RNA. Um, and then we see that the RNA is uh, held tightly by the 1B and Rec A domains. And we're fairly confident in our modeling. Uh, so we show a case the cryo density here. And then the next few frames will showcase the open state uh, in which the 1B domain is rotated downward towards the ZBDs and stock domain. And this is the cryo map for that. Um, and here's a back view of this particular class, and we see that this downstream uh, template RNA doesn't thread through the active site and it's not engaged with the helix case, essentially. And another interesting thing that we noted from our structure is that this NSB 13.1 stabilizes the open confirmation, and it would impede the inner conversion between open and engage. Um, so what we postulate is that this swivel state is kind of a transition state between the open and closed state uh, or engaged state, and that the heel case will have to adopt the swivel state in order to interconvert. And the cryo mat density is shown here. And this swivel state has to be visited in order to convert from open to engaged. And this is shown here. Sorry about that. Um, so what's the functional significance of the engage and open confirmations of NSP 13.1? So when we see, looked at the open confirmation, we see that the helicase is not making contacts with the downstream template RNA, and thus uh, it's not in a position to kind of uh, oppose the translocation of the RDRP. So in this case, the RDRP or replication transcription complex can um, uh, proceed with uh, transcription or replication. Uh, whereas in the engaged class, the downstream template RNA is um, engaged completely uh, and crossed by the uh, SB13.1, Rec A1, and Rec A2 domains, along with the B, uh, 1B. And this uh, allows the helicase to engage with the RNA scaffold and then uh, translate, uh, translocate. Uh, in a way that opposes the translocation of the RDRP. Uh, a subsequent consequence of this is the reverse translocation of the RDRP, and this could lead to um, uh, backtracking, um, which Brandon will uh, allude to in his uh, slides. Thanks, James. Uh, so to look at the schematic in which, to look at a, a model in which NSP13 may interplay with the polymerase, I've shown here a schematic of the polymerase in the post translocated active site state, and this is refers to a state in which the active site is free for an incoming nucleotide to bind, as shown here. So uh, at the high um, NTP concentration of the sodium low, uh, NTP uh, binding is uh, readily occurs, and this undergoes catalysis and entrance into a pre-translocated active site state in which the tree prime end of the product RNA occupies the active site region. This undergoes a quick equilibrium shift to a pre to post translocation, and this resets the nucleotide addition cycle for many more rounds of elongation. However, in the case where a non-cognate nucleotide or a nucleotide analog may bind, there may be perturbations at the active site that would disfavor catalysis uh, compared to natural nucleotides, and this could lead to 
Uh, and this may be due to um, an incorrect geometry of the increment base compared to your template base. And this, but this can still go undergo catalysis, but to um, usually to a lesser extent. And we believe that this uh, perturbation may allow for an, an allosteric activation of NSP13 and facilitate this open to engage transition that James described in the classification results. Activation of NSP13 would mediate the five prime to three prime template RNA unwinding uh, in the direction as shown here. And this would generate a single stranded product RNA overhang um, in this process that James described as backtracking, uh, which is well described for cellular RNAPs is, and is used to um, in, uh, allow for transcriptional fidelity and proofreading. Therefore, to test, to test whether NSP13 can induce backtracking, we designed a system in which we placed uh, a zero length crosslinker, 4 tar uridine, in two bases from the tree prime end of the product RNA. Uh, 4 tar uridine is a, a UV activatable crosslinker that can uh, form RNA protein um, heteroconjugates. So in this setup, we believe that activation of NSP13 in the presence of ATP will allow for um, a generation of a single-stranded product RNA overhang that contains this 4 tar uridine base as shown in green here. And in the presence of um, UV exposure, this then leads to an RNA protein crosslink. We observed that there was a significant enhancement of the crosslinking activity um, of the 4 tar uridine in the presence of NSP13 and that this was dependent on UV exposure, indicative that um, NSP13 uh, can mediate backtracking. With this in hand, we decided to identify the structural basis for backtracking. And to do this, we took inspiration from prior work done on RNA pol 2 from uh, Patrick Kramer's lab in 2012, in which they utilized a, a series of, con in which they utilized a construct which featured a, a product RNA mismatch. So we designed constructs that featured uh, that we call BTC3 uh, and BTC5 and tested the association of the hollowed UP onto these constructs. Uh, and we observed that in the absence of NSP13, that there was relatively little binding of the hollowed UP to this uh, backtrack scaffold. Uh, and it required NSP13 to form a stable complex, indicative that NSP13 is needed, it is needed to bind uh, for a backtrack scaffold. Um, Given the formation of a stable complex, we decided to utilize single particle cryo analysis to investigate the structural basis of backtracking. So here in this uh, data set, we obtained two major populations of particles, one in which there was one copy of NSP13, uh, which was also shown for the RTC, and another uh, population which shows two copies of NSP13, to, NSP13 bound to the hollow UP. To obtain a, a better resolution reconstruction for the hollow UP portion of the map, we performed focus refinement and uh, obtained a 3.2 angstrom uh, resolution reconstruction for this uh, map. This allowed us to unequivocally model the um, bases in of the backtracked bases, and they were found to reside in the NTP entry channel that James introduced earlier, and this is shown here. So, looking at a model in which NSP13 may interplay with the helicon, where NSP13 may interplay with the polymerase. Uh, we're going to go back to the last frame that James showed in his earlier slide, in which you're looking at the engaged state. So here we're going to take you to a side view, and we're going to um, take a closer look at the RDP active site region um, of, the, um, of the complex. Um, so what we decided to uh, do was check whether or not a nucleotide missing cooperation may facilitate backtracking. And to do this, we collaborated with an electrodynamic simulations um, or an MD group at DE Shaw, who performed a MD who performed a simulation of a a construct that featured um, an AC mismatch in the pre translocated state in the active site. And what I'm going to show you here on the right is the start of the simulation. So, this is one of the first frames in which the cytidine forms a non waxen crick base pair with the A. And what we're going to do is we're going to follow this over a five microsecond simulation. So what you quickly notice is that the base readily flips and spontaneously flips out of the active site and into this periphery channel, which is the NTP entry channel. Uh, and shown here is one of the later frames of simulation. And it's here is a still of the initial state and the final and the, one of the final states in which this is from the orange uh, MD sim simulation shown here, in which there is a spontaneous but irreversible um, flip into the NTP entry channel. And this was shown over two further replicates. Um, 
So here we believe that NFP13 may further precipitate backtracking, and this can be uh, uh, shown in this model as shown as uh, we reveal next. So NSP13 in the gauge state is bound to a nucleotide, and this can be then hydrolyzed and lead to further backtracking. Release of the nucleotide triggers the conversion into uh, what we called earlier the APO state in classification results, in which is characterized by an outward rotation of the rep A1 domain relative to rep A2 of approximately 21 degrees. Uh, in this APO state, uh, NSP13.1 can associate potentially with the next nucleotide, so the next ATP, and the ATP can bind, and this can lead to closure of the NSP13.1 active site and uh, immediate hydrolysis of the ATP, which facilitates further backtracking. Um, and this can continue to occur in cyclic fashion, in which uh, further ATP hydrolysis will mediate uh, more backtracking of the RDRP until the backtracked pRNA is accessible. And this may mediate interactions um, between the backtracked pRNA with other RNA elements of the coronavirus genome or with other um, uh, enzymatic components of the replication transcription complex. So to allude to one of these examples, I'm just going to go back to uh, an, what was an earlier slide from James in the introduction in which he asked why the coronavirus has possessed accessory factors. So one of the reasons why we think uh, coronavirus is needed to heal a case is to undergo this process of discontinuous or transcription in which uh, the uh, RTC loads onto the poly A tail and mediates extension of, or mediates um, synthesis of a copy of the genome uh, from the five prime street one direction. It's known that there is a, a stalling step upon when the RTC uh, tries to elongate through and um, this uh, transcription regulatory sequence or the uh, TRS and shown here is the RTC stalled at where it's at this uh, compared to TRS sequence. We believe that this stalling may facilitate the open to engage transition of NSP13 and this may lead to uh, NSP13 induced backtracking, which will uh, lead to the extrusion of the product RNA sequence that features this complementary TRS sequence out through the NTP entry channel. This complementary TRS sequence has been known to or has been taught to associate and uh, base pair with an upstream um, element known as the transcription regulatory um, sequence leader, which is at the five prime end of the coronavirus genome. This would uh, allow for formation of a new RNA-RNA duplex in which a second hollow RDP can associate to and mediate the extension of the complementary sequence of the five prime uh, UTR and five prime uh, TR, uh, TRS sequence. Uh, and this will produce then a subgenomic uh, um, mRNA sequence that's a, a minus sense, which can then be used to produce positive sense subgenomic mRNA transcripts. Another example in which we believe that NFP13 and backtracking may play a role is in this um, proofreading cycle in which um, James alluded to earlier that uh, coronaviruses are unique enough to possess a 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease. We believe that during the normal elongation cycle, the NFP13 is in the open state and it can facilitate the RDP elongation of the uh, nascent strand. However, in the case where there's a mismatch or an NTP analog that can be incorporated, as shown, um, is that we believe that based on the MD simulations, that this uh, mismatch will facilitate entry into a backtracking prone state, which allows for NSP13 engagement and facilitates um, the uh, backtracking uh, of the product RNA. This, back, this erroneous product RNA features this mismatched or nucleotide analog, which presents its three prime end um, for uh, the enzymatic component of uh, NSP1014, this proofreading complex. So uh, it can bind to and uh, excise the missing property nucleotide, free in the RDRP to continue um, its uh, um, elongation of the, uh, and can free to continue RNA synthesis. Um, so, Finally, I just want to um, acknowledge the um, collaboration that uh, we had in this project. So James and I started this project uh, at, just, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, and we had the help of a, a, a research assistant in the lab, uh, Liza Lewin at the time, and uh, more recently, um, Young Chu, and uh, thank you to our PIs, Liz and Seth. Uh, and specifically, I want to also acknowledge uh, the work by Damo Neris, who's a, a longtime colleague of the lab, and he performs, um, uh, um, he allows us to characterize complexes using native mass spec, which is 
uh, quite useful uh, for uh, for REM analysis. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge the work done by Chi Wang, who performed EMD simulations, and he's a research associate at DE Shaw, as well as this work would not be feasible without the tremendous support uh, from the Crarium research staff at the Rockford University, as well as at New York Structural Biology Center. Uh, and uh, James and I are happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Brandon, and thank you, James. That was really absolutely gorgeous. Um, so many structures <laughs> that came out of, of um, you know, more structures than, than data sets. That's, that's really cool to see when you get so much information from um, from one data collection. Um, so um, if there are questions from the audience, please send those in um, using the, the Q&A. Um, I'll start out with the first one I see there. Um, going back to uh, using CHAPSO for your uh, preferred orientation issues, um, do you add it just before freezing or is that in your buffer during SEC? Uh, so we usually add it just prior to freezing the grid. So what we would run the sec and then like have aliquots the protein that will assemble with the RNA scaffold and add chaps immediately uh, before freezing the grid. And this is at eight millimolar, uh, which is close to one X CMC. Thank you. Um, this is Mike. Uh, I have a quick question. If uh, uh, panelists can't enter into the <laughs> Q and <laughs> can't ask questions via Q and A, I guess we have to do it uh, by uh, one, uh, two questions. One about specimen preparation. Uh, did you find that 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 discovering Chapso was the? Did you use that also in in Brandon's uh, uh, work too? And did uh, did Chapso was that the magic bullet for both of those particular forms of this of this complex? Uh, yes. Sure. Yeah. So in the with the NSP thirteen barons, Chapso is quite um, quite, quite crucial. Uh, other groups have uh, just on the hollow of your P portion, or when they're freezing hollow of your P, have had uh, success with DDN and uh, beta OG is actually quite useful for uh, that alone. Um, but um, yeah, with uh, with the Hela case, it was uh, we could never get um, yeah. The and, and and one one question about the uh, about the difference between these two these two kinds of um, uh, adjustments of the of the synthesis pathway, one of proofreading, and the other of the template switching. Uh, those seem to both activate the same kind of uh, direction for uh, for the motion of the RNA through there. Is exactly where what what is the difference between where does it branch away from? Oh, this was proofreading versus oh, this is template switching. Um, so we believe that template switching it occurs or it's taught to occur at uh, these TRS sequences, which there is actually. There are hexameric sequences that, and uh, there's like nine conserved TRS sequence over the 30 kb genome. So it's actually not a, um, there is some cases where um, using uh, uh, technologies like nanopore sequencing, uh, uh, groups have discovered that there is like TRS independence, but they tend to be um, uh, quite low frequency invariants in that they tend to occur um, more sporadically than these TRS dependent ones. Uh, but the the ACE ladder TRSs are exactly complementary to the, uh, and they're, they're complementary sequence uh, can base pair with the 5 prime TRS leader. Um, but it's, present, it's, prob, it's presumed that uh, the template switching also occurs with other accessory factors. So um, some uh, prior work has indicated that there's other actually cellular helicases that also may facilitate it. And um, so there might be some also, it's, it's definitely more complicated than the uh, 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 and then the tangent from a kind of reductionist point of view, but it's I think it's a great question. Yeah. Actually, uh, related to that, there's a question of um, the template switching can be recapitulated by recombinant proteins. 
Um, not uh, it's. I haven't uh, seen any. Um, um, I, I think it's. A, I think it would be fascinating to do, but I actually haven't seen any uh, uh, results where template switching was being uh, recapitulated for dominant proteins. We actually. Uh, uh, but it, I think it's a. It would be incredibly fascinating to do. Yes. <laughs> Awesome. So um, there is a question about uh, the different complexes that you found um, within your within your data sets um, with different stoichiometries. Uh, do you think they could have any biological significance? Uh, yeah, I can comment on that. Um, so in our chapter data set, we saw basically the RTC bound to one helicase. And in this case, like the NSP 13.1 is always engaged. Um, so maybe this is like the predominant form that happens in the cell. Um, whereas like uh, for the two NSP bound RTC, we saw that we have this state where it could, uh, the 1B domain is basically rotated and then uh, basically it's not engaged with the downstream template RNA. And presumably by, and like, if we look at this biologically, we could say that uh, by having the NSP 13s bound there, we can have a high local concentration of the helicase. Uh, so like when like misincorporation happens, the NSP 13 can engage immediately and remove that um, uh, misincorporation. And lastly, um, interestingly, I didn't really talk about this earlier. Uh, so the dimer in which we see a dimer of the RTC bound to two helicases, the 1B domain is predominantly open. And that's suggestive of some probably super processive state. Um, but I, we haven't tested it. Um, but that's just speculation. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, there's a question about your um, focus refinement procedure um, and whether you could comment a bit more on, on, on that. Yeah, is this regarding the backtrack complexes? Um, it does not say if uh, if there are more, if if there's a specific uh, structure you were thinking of. Go ahead and send in a new question in the Q and A. Um, Otherwise, you can pick your favorite one to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for the, I guess for the backtrack um, complex, we saw two distinct classes, uh, one where the BTC is bound to one helicase and the other bound to um, two helicases. Uh, so we built in individual maps for each class and kind of examined the NTP channel and confirmed that the RNA confirmation is basically the same between the two classes. And what we end up doing is basically sub uh, doing signal subtraction, uh, basically keeping the signal around the, act, um, the BTC and removing the helicase, since the helicase itself is quite mobile um, in nature. Uh, so we basically subtracted the helicase from those uh, particles and then combined the two classes and refined around the uh, BTC. And that gave us uh, a slight improvement in resolution. I believe it's around 3.2. And individually, the classes were like 3.5 or 3.6. Great, thanks. Um, there is a question um, about whether you screen your complexes using negative stain before going to cryo. That's a fantastic question. <laughs> Um, yeah, so in our case, we kind of jumped right into the cryo because like the microscopes were available, but I would imagine like it would be quite hard to see the RNA alone uh, by negative stain. Um, I, I feel like it's hard to see just free nucleic acid alone, uh, but maybe in the context of like the RNA bound to the protein, you may be able to see it. Um, usually you need some type of shadowing method in order to see um, kind of longer RNA nucleic acids. Okay. 
Great, thanks. Uh, one more question yeah. about, hi, this is Mike again. Uh, uh, one more question about uh, the, the uh, focus classification. What was the smallest difference in terms of molecular weight chunks that you would say that you can um, reliably see with focus classification in, in terms of fractions to say of the, of the whole object uh, and, and watching for focus classification of one piece? What was the smallest piece you would consider? Um, they, the, in our case, like something that's greater than uh, 70 kilodaltons. Um, so like in our case, we chose to do the focus classification around uh, both helicases, rec A and 1B domains, as opposed to just doing like the individual uh, helicase domains. Uh, and we saw that when we do the classification with both helicase domains, present, um, uh, it gave us more uh, robust results. I think it's also interesting to add that, I mean, because also the concerted action in which some of the domains are like coupled to either loss of a nucleotide or potential loss of the RNA that we also, the classification also allowed us to at least piece apart the, like if we could also see much smaller elements weren't in the density just based on Direct it means being open or uh, just one B switch, and we lost uh, the dot density for the tRNA that was bound. Yeah, so the, so the signal was a large piece of a large piece of different density, but that signal also told you where other things were that were smaller than that, uh, yeah. because they all followed with that particular kind of uh, focus. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You can see smaller things, uh, but but the basis of the classification was something on the order of, you say, 70, 80 kilodalton chunks that would be different enough that you could tell. Okay. Yeah. I don't think we adjusted the, in the T parameter at all, James. I don't think we didn't. I know some people like to, in yeah. the classification, to adjust it to try and identify higher resolution noise potentially, but we uh, usually uh, stick to yeah. more default. <laughs> yeah, we usually stick to like pretty like, default like settings for the towel. Um, otherwise like he like runs you like overfitting and whatnot. All right. There's a question about your uh, choice of software. Um, <laughs> and do you do you think CryoSpark is best? <laughs> um. um I guess like it's best to like kind of explore as many like processing routes as possible. Like they're trying different softwares and different pipelines. Uh, in our case, uh, we kind of chose CryoSpark uh, since uh, we kind of like the speed and like having like results kind of pump out and like see, we could try a lot of things in parallel. Um, so in our case, um, uh, using CryoSpark made sense um, in terms of if it's best for reconstruction, uh, I think the non-uniform refinement was quite useful. Um, basically, because we have these like very mobile helicase domains, uh, the non-uniform refinement really helped kind of define density around that region uh, better than uh, rely on. Um, and I'd also add that we all, but we also. Uh, incorporated by Asian Polish and Earn Reliant, which is probably the, the staple for most of our process. Like uh, that, that leads to one of the best reservation improvements we get. Yes. Yeah. Great, thanks. We still have time for for another question or two. So if, if there are final questions, feel free to send them in. Um, I have a question myself, actually. Um, Brandon, for the MD simulations right there, you have a lot of options of what model you start with. Um, so sort of which maps do you end up using for the model you use? Um, how, and how do you make those decisions? Um, yeah, that's a, a so we we started with the the, the consensus map for the um, the classification results at James was at two point nine, and for the MD simulations because it was all Adam, so it wasn't any uh, uh, we like there was regions where we um, 
for example, that may, may have been at, the, but we only uh, like at the C terminus of N three thirteen, where you know it's 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 much lower resolution, but we still we had kind of like um, conservative built, built this and the side chains, but then we for the MD simulation um, made it so that like all of the information was included, and um, but yeah, we started with the 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 construct that was in the um, uh, yeah our kind of our main model, and our and that model is the specifically the RDRP region between just because there's been a numerous there's been numerous um RDRP structures and the C alpha RMSD between our the RDRPs is quite similar between uh, group like um models that we've um, built and some from Patrick Kramer and uh, the Eurus group. Great. Thanks. And uh, we've got one last question. Um, so how much improvement did you see um, with the Bayesian polishing? Um... Oh, um, I, I think if I recall like 0.3 angstroms like prior to polishing. So it, it was a big jump. Um, it's usually like 0.2 to 0.3 angstrom improvement. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting to note like the grids that we're using are C flat with 10, which for some reason tend to drift a lot more. So we do see like a pretty good improvement at their particle polishing. Uh, whereas like, I guess like samples on like graphene or some type of continuous carbon, they don't drift as much. Um, so maybe like the polishing wouldn't give such results. Great, thanks. So we're, we're coming up on the hour um, and it seems like all of the questions have been answered. So thank you again, uh, James and Brandon. That was, that was really fantastic biology, biochemistry and cryo -EM. Um, So thank you for, for sharing that with us. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us today. Uh, we wish everyone well in your cryo endeavors and uh, let us at the National Centers, let us know how we can help you. And uh, we hope to see you again at one of our other webinars.